Welcome to Install From Heat, Episode 5, a Netrunner podcast from Rattlebox Games about jank, deck building, and cyberpunk nonsense. I'm Brendan Riley. Falconry, running, and you. Introduction The bond between animal and human can be strong and rewarding. We have a dog, Loki, who's been part of our family for 16 years. He's a cranky old man now, wandering around the place, barking at the local kids to get off our lawn, and forgetting that we already fed him. But we love him, and he's part of the family. You don't see a lot of pets in Netrunner. Some of the dog-themed icebreakers look like they might be aimed that way, but Lady, Rex, and Cooge.O were from different factions, so building a deck around them took a lot of influence. To be honest, these came out before I was heavily involved in the game, so I don't really know how people used them at the time. It seems like Lady was the only one that caught on, as she's been added to the Most Wanted list, Fantasy Flight's list of cards that cost extra influence to be used in tournament play. But the thematic player in me, the Janker, wants a pet-themed deck, and with the release of the Bird Suite of Breakers in this cycle, I've got my wish. Insert con joke here. Con is an entertaining runner. She's a natural, she has... Zero link, but she has an interesting 40 minimum deck size. She only has 12 influence, but with a smaller deck, you maybe don't need as many influence. Her special skill is, the first time you pass a piece of ice each turn, you may install an icebreaker from your hand, lowering the install cost by one. Also, she's criminal. So the question is, what do we do with Khan? In the picture, she's wearing goggles and a gauntlet, and she's got a sort of digital falcon on her arm. And uh, her subtitle is Savvy Skip Tracer. Not sure what a skip tracer is, but it sounds pretty sweet. So Khan seems like she should have something cool. You can install an icebreaker from your hand, so you can't do it from the heap. But And then they release her suite of breakers. They have uh, Saker and Peregrine and Golden, uh, three icebreakers that all do the same thing for different subtypes. Basically, they cost a lot to break the ice, but then you can spend two more credits to de-res the ice, but then you return the bird to your hand, which is, you know, sort of an amusing bit of theme. They also released for her a console called Gauntlet. Now, Gauntlet's an interesting one. The art is pretty good. It's quite clear what it is. Uh, It gives you two memory. It only costs five to install, which isn't bad for a console. And it's influence one. I'm not sure what they expect other people are going to be doing with it, but The power is sort of an HQ interface. Whenever you access cards from HQ during a run, access one additional card for each piece of ice protecting HQ that you broke all subroutines on during this run. That's an interesting limit. And actually pretty hard to use with Khan because her icebreakers are so expensive. Um, Also, it comes with the limit one console per player. Uh, It will stand well when the uh, HQ interface cycles out uh, after the Mars... um, card packs come out. So I really like Khan, and I would like to figure out how to use her in a deck. So the question is, how do you use these birds? If used right, Khan should make the corp hide inside, looking out in fear at her feathered breakers swooping in from the sky. You all right? Yes, I think so. What do you suppose made it do that? That's the damnest thing I ever saw. I don't know. It seemed to swoop down at you deliberately. Oh, you're bleeding, too. Let's take care of that. Okay? That's the girl. Thinking about Khan, I read up a little bit on Netrunner DB, and I found that someone named B Radical 3 and another one person called PKSK uh, had thoughts on uh, Khan decks. One of the B Radical 3 had put up a deck to begin with, and then I posted my version, uh, and PKSK uh, made some comments. So as I'm deck building with Khan, my question is, how do you best use this ID? How do you capitalize on the de-res capability of the breakers? And how do you generate enough money to do all that? And here's the answer I'm using. First off, I have two each of Golden, Peregrine, and Saker, her breakers. And then I have two special orders, which gives me uh, a pretty good chance of drawing her cards, especially if I keep it to 40 cards, which I've done. The first couple times I played, I tried with smaller numbers of the breakers, and I was having a lot of trouble getting them. So uh, I think that's important. I also have three Sahasrara. Okay. Three Sahasrara, which is the Shaper 
uh, program that gives you two recurring credits to install programs with. Now, this is really important, and uh, obviously I'm spending six influence for those three cards. I have one data sucker and one clot as well. The data sucker is really important because the weird numbers on the icebreakers make it hard to break ice cheap, and using data sucker tokens helps with that. The clot is really important because this is a slow rig to build, and so um, without the clot, you might have a, a fast advanced deck that gets away from you. So how do you make enough money to do all this? I've got a mix of things. The drip economy comes from Daily Cast. Uh, I have two Katie Jones in the deck, which um, she's a really good uh, sort of medium build uh, economy, really good for building up a, a sort of bolus of money and then getting it all at once when you need to do a run. And uh, a couple of Temujin contracts for when um, the corp leaves a server open for running. For draw, I have three Earth Rise, Earth Rise Hotel. Uh, and two same old thing to bring back events. And then the crucial the crucial include here is three inside job. The way I've been playing the deck, inside job is the key to making this deck work. As I'm making early runs, you can use inside job to get past when there's just one ice. So then you're getting an access. But also, more importantly, you're triggering Khan's ability. Because you remember that Khan, when the first time she passes a piece of ice each turn, she can stall an icebreaker from hand. So if you use an inside job, then you're passing an ice without encountering it, but you still get to trigger her ability, which reduces the cost by one. And if you've managed to get a Saha, Sahasrara or two Sahasraras installed, then your install of your icebreaker is not only you know, you don't use a click to do it. It's also free because of your recurring credits. So when, when the rig is really working right, you get a Sahasrara early and you get to install your icebreakers as you pull them into your hand for relatively cheap, if not free. That's in the early runs. Mid to late game gets expensive, but that's where the return to hand part and the Sahasraras really pay off is that when you're running, if the corp has an expensive piece of ice as its outermost ice on a server, then you can really wham them because you run it, you break all the subroutines, and then you pull the pull your breaker back to hand for two credits. Now their ice is derezzed, and now you get your four free credits from Sahasrara to reinstall your ice immediately as you pass your icebreaker. And so you have your breaker back, and now they have have to res their expensive ice again. Like I said, it's an expensive tactic, but it's really good. Interestingly, and I suppose this is why Khan and... Haas Bioroid's Architects of Tomorrow were released at the same time, Khan is really annoying to Architects of Tomorrow because when she de their outermost Bioroid, then they don't get to use their bonus because the, the Architects of Tomorrow only get their four credit discount when you pass a resed piece of ice. Um, I actually had an opponent say in, in the chat, so I never get to fire my ability? And I said, I guess not. So that that's the con deck that I've come up with. It's pretty good, but like I said, it's really expensive, and I don't think it's ever going to be top tier because uh, the economy is just too hard to hold up. I also haven't played anybody with a really efficient or vicious corp deck yet with this one, so I imagine as I use it more, it'll become less good. Predictive Algorithm So as I play online more, and I talk through things with my daughter, which that's the way we've been playing lately, is that we sit together and play on Jinteki, and we talk through what's happening. I'm discovering that I'm able to... I'm getting better at predicting what my opponent's going to do, be it, okay, they're probably going to install there, or uh, they're going to do this or that. In particular, there was there was uh, one game we were playing where I said, okay, now he's probably going to run our HQ with a account siphon. And boom, account siphon. In that way, sometimes playing Netrunner feels a little bit like taking a latent psychic ability test, especially when you get one wrong. Nervous? Yes. I don't like this. You only have 75 more to go, okay? What's this one? It's, it's a couple of wavy lines. Sorry, this isn't your lucky day. <laughs> I know. Do you hear? Well, I... But it's not, I uh, ah! I'm getting a little tired of this! You so I've been thinking about why I'm getting better at doing this kind of prediction. And I think part of it is that I've, I've engaged myself more thoroughly with the community. There's a lot of really good articles on stimhack.com about how to think more thoughtfully about your play. Uh, and that's been helping a lot. I also listen to other podcasts, Bad Publicity, Run Last Click, and Terminal 7, and The Winning Agenda are all very good. 
Um, I really enjoy Nerd Runners, but they haven't put out a new episode in quite a while, so I don't I don't know that that's ever coming back. Um, but those are good ways to to sort of think about the community and think about what's going on. Um, as a from a sort of positive and negative perspective, from a positive, uh, you know the that experience I had predicting cards highlighted the value of this research I've been doing. I think that uh, listening to these podcasts helps make me better at evaluating cards. I can more quickly see when when it might be silly to try to build my deck around a card because I can recognize its flaws a little better. Uh, and I think ultimately I'm more effective as a player, in part because I don't make so many mistakes. On the other hand, a lot of these podcasts, I think, emphasize winning a little too much. Um, they don't have enough fun with the the deck, uh, you know, part, part of what I like about the winning agenda, especially nerd runners, is that they spend a lot of time talking about jank, jank play. And obviously that's what I really like. Uh, and I wish that I could find a few more podcasts that talk about building weird decks and, and playing with them. I think it's also the more heavily you're engaged with the community, the easier it is to get stuck in groupthink. Uh, you know, a lot of people early on were not liking con and, and sort of talking about the gauntlet as a bad console before anyone got to play with it. And uh, I am a little worried about myself getting caught up in that. I also don't want to get too caught up in the meta play um, and thinking about, oh, I do or don't want to play this deck because that's part of the meta. So um, those are the things I've been struggling with as I try to do my research a little bit more and get better at Netrunner. So I guess I'm curious, listener, uh, how do you do your research? Uh, let me know on Twitter or on our blog or wherever you can find me. There's lots of places. <laughs> Flavor of the week, Con, the Bird Suite, and Gauntlet. As I do every week, this is part of my ongoing tribute to Stimhack.com's uh, seemingly defunct series of columns on flavor and theme running on italics. So this week I want to talk about the theme of falconry. George Brimpton here, inviting you to join me in a sport that has been the pastime of kings, hunters, and warriors for nearly 4,000 years. Video falconry is a tour of the American landscape accompanied by the world's most majestic birds of prey. It features challenging and exciting gameplay and the most amazing video effects available today. George Clinton's Video Falconry, available along with many other fine titles only on ColecoVision, the only system you'll ever need. That audio clip was from... Uh... John Hodgman joke that turned into an internet joke uh, in which they imagined that George Plimpton uh, had helped create a ColecoVision game called Video Falconry. I thought of that, obviously, because Khan seems to be a, a person who likes falconry. And actually, the, the three breakers that they've introduced for her all so together seem to make a single piece of thematic narrative. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to read those to you. Peregrine, the theme... The theme for Peregrine, which is the code gate breaker, says Khan's avatar lifted her arm and the bird launched itself into the air. Golden, the sentry breaker, says the program was as close to a hunting raptor as she could afford for now. And Saker says spiraling ever higher, every feature of cyberspace sprawled before it. That's the barrier breaker, Saker. So, you know, we have Khan who has the Falcon, and we have Saker and Golden and Peregrine, all of which have this really interesting two-credit paid ability. Return to your grip. Derez a barrier, or whatever the Saker says barrier. Derez a barrier. Use this ability only after using Saker to break all the subroutines on that barrier during a single encounter. So this thematically is amazing, right? You have this breaker, it leaves your grip, it goes in, it bashes through the ice and then you can have it derez the ice and return to your grip just like a falcon coming back with its dead prey it's beautiful it is really a great piece of theme and while the breakers tend to be a little bit expensive to use they are it is a, a fantastic thematic mechanism and then you get to gauntlet of course it would be called the gauntlet because it's she wears it on her hand like a bird gauntlet that's precisely what it is comes with two memory which is really good because in order to make these birds work, you need some extra install, like the Sahasraha, which is uh, the example I use. But there are a variety of ways that people make them work, but you can only do it with more memory. So two memory is excellent. But then it says, whenever you access cards from HQ during a run, 
Access one additional card for each piece of ice protecting HQ that you broke all subroutines on during this run. Limit one console per player. What? Wh this? What does this have to do with birds? It, it doesn't feel at all thematic. It really doesn't seem like it fits the rest of the cards. It's so obnoxious. Here's a couple that I would say. One... Whenever you return a card from play to your grip, gain a credit. That would make a lot of sense. There are other cards that do that, so it, it wouldn't be out of the question for people to use the gauntlet in context with other return cards from play to grip. You could imagine it. Um, boy, it would help if I could think of other cards. But I know there are other cards that do that, right? Or maybe you could say from play or from your rig or your archive or your heap. So maybe if you can grab, if you grab a card out of your heap straight into your grip, you gain a credit or something, you know, that would be an interesting way to reward the bringing back of things, which is what the gauntlet is about. Or perhaps recall an icebreaker from the heap, or maybe recall, recall an icebreaker from the heap. If it was at, you know, any icebreaker added to the heap since the beginning of your last turn can be recalled for a click or something that again would play into this idea of the grit of the gauntlet being able to pull things back. It would also capitalize on the um, the idea of icebreakers in the heap being recoverable. Um, both of those would make a lot of sense, but I don't understand why the gauntlet should let you get extra cards in HQ. It just, thematically, it's terrible. It's terrible. So for the birds, Saker, Golden, Peregrine, I'm giving those an A for theme. They go really well with Khan and they fit nicely. The gauntlet... D. The only reason it's not an F is that it's a perfect name and the art is nice. Conclusion. Well, that wraps up Install from Heap episode 5. If you have suggestions for future topics or comments on the show, I'd love to hear them. In particular, I did this episode much more extemporaneously than previous episodes have been done, and I'd be interested to hear what you think. Do you prefer the more rehearsed, careful script, or do you prefer a more off-the-cuff and perhaps a little less polished version of this conversation? You can send email to brendan at rattleboxgames.com or tweet to Rattlebox Games with that feedback. You can also visit our website, rattleboxgames.com, to subscribe to our newsletter or follow the link to our forums on boardgamegeek.com, where my username is wombat929. I'd always enjoy losing a game of Netrunner to you on Jinteki.net, where my username is also Wombat929. So in the time it took me to record and edit this, it became a new year. Happy New Year, Netrunners. Let's hope 2017 is as great for Netrunner as 2016 was. See you next time. But until then, remember, when all your best cards end up in the trash, you can always install from heat. Today's media clips were from The Birds, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, Ghostbusters, directed by Ivan Reitman, George Plimpton's Video Falconry, a video on YouTube made out of a joke from a John Hodgman podcast. See you next time. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games. <laughs>